This presentation on the painful hip in the adolescent, the senior and the athlete will address the frequently encountered disorders on plane radiographs and MRI. It will also show the age-related changes and the sport-related pathology in the hip joint and will also assess the value of primarily X-rays in the painful arthroplasty. The painful hip is a common clinical problem which commonly terrifies the clinicians because it's a difficult joint to assess clinically. The clinical tests are not, are not as accurate as the ones for the knee joint, for instance. Many disorders share same symptoms and clinical findings and that's why imaging is important for early diagnosis and treatment planning. Starting from the adolescent hip, we have two main categories of disorders, the sports-related injuries and the tumors, which mainly uh, is one benign tumor, the osteoid osteoma. The sports-related injuries cover a wide spectrum, including the extra-articular causes, such as avulsion fractures, which are best assessed with X-rays, tendon, muscle, and bone marrow changes, better assessed with MRI, labral tears shown with MR arthrography, osteochondritis, desiccans, and slept femoral capital epiphysis. Uh, which are better explored with X-rays and or MRI. This is a football athlete which shows an avulsion fracture of the anterior superior iliac spine. This was treated surgically because it migrated more than two centimeters from the apophysis. The avulsion fractures are best assessed with plain X-rays. This is another athlete with bone marrow edema and external obturator muscle, a small hematoma here, and the quadratus femoris muscle. In general, the muscle strains are classified according to the severity as grades one to three. One is just bone marrow edema, as we say, sorry, as edema within the muscle as we see here in this iliosos muscle, basketball injury, and grade two where there's a small lake of hematoma formation as we see here. Grade three represents completely torn muscle. When the avulsion injuries are occult on plain radiographs and still there is a strong clinical suspicion then MRI is the best way to go here we see a microavulsion of the hamstring insertion on the left side with bone marrow edema within the ischial bone. Here we see the microavulsion. These injuries are occult on plain radiographs. Chronic avulsion injuries, as in this case here in the ischial bone and the hamstring insertion, may have a bizarre appearance which may simulate neoplastic disorders such as parosteal osteosarcoma. In the adolescent period we may also see epiphysiolysis and allesthesis in uh, obese uh, adolescents or athletes. In this particular case the bone scan suggests a vascular necrosis but MRI shows nicely the lysis of the growth plate here. There is a diastasis and some minor posterior allesthesis with reactive bone marrow edema on both sides of the growth plate. In another uh, young uh, patient with a painful hip, a plain radiograph shows a osteolytic area here with not very well defined border and coronal T1 MRI shows this small flag of bone which has low signal intensity as opposed 
to the higher signal intensity of the of the femoral hand and therefore this suggests necrosis. CT confirms that this bone here is necrotic because it is sclerotic. There is also a small loose body here and is a typical unstable osteochondritis desiccans. Osteoid osteomas in the hip area are not as the ones in the long bones because they are usually intracapsular and the intracapsular ones show atypical clinical presentations such as uh, absence of night pain, perhaps um, no response to aspirin and analgesics and radiologically we are not seeing thick periosteal reaction, rather we see reactive bone marrow edema. In all these cases, uh, if we see or if we not depict any lysis with a nidus inside, we always need to go to thin slice CT, which is the method of choice to depict small intracapsular osteoidosteomas. Let's move now to the seniors here. How do we start? First, we need to have access to recent anterior posterior film and we need to be familiar with the basic measurements and angles of the, of, uh, the hip joint. We need also to know the edge related changes and pick up the risk factors for earlier arthritis. We need also to know what to look for in MRI exams of middle aged and elderly patients with hip pain. The commonly found transient osteoporosis of the hip and avascular necrosis were presented in another lecture. Uh, in the elderly, in particular, if we need to answer the question in the emergencies if there is any non displayed fractures, we have to follow a systematic approach. The bony landmarks are very helpful in this respect. We need to see that they are, they are intact. The iliopubic line, the iliopubic line, the obturator ring, the posterior acetabular ring, the anterior acetabular ring, the medial acetabular wall or teardrop, the femoral hand coverage from the acetabulum, the cortical integrity of the femoral neck and hand and the trabecular pattern. The normal hip radiograph should show a joint space width of more than 2.5 millimeters. In addition, the sclerotic line, which is the weight bearing surface, should be flat in its lateral edge. The first and the most important angle to be familiar with is the so-called CE center to edge or Weiberg's angle. This is drawn from the central part of a circle which is the femoral hand towards the ends of the acetabulum and the angle is formed with a vertical line. This should normally be more than 25 degrees. If less than 20, then uh, this is a diagnostic uh, measurement for developmental dysplasia of the hip, as we see here. If it's more than 42, then we have definitely another coverage, a coxa profunda of the hip joint. Another angle, which is formed by the horizontal line, and the line connecting the edges of the weight bearing surface is called horizontal droit externe or tonis angle. This angle should be normally less than 10 degrees. If it is more than 12, then this angle confirms the abnormal C angle from, for a developmental dysplasia of the hip. If it's less than minus 5, then we have a deep acetabulum, a noble coverage of the femoral hand. A film which is not routinely ob obtained 
is the VCA or the Cassin's view. This view is very important as this is the only one to assess the anterior child's space. This view is taken with a foot parallel with the cassette and the patient standing 25 degrees with respect to the X rays. Normally, it should be more than 25. Developmental displays of the hip shows VCA ankle of less than 20. The deep acetabulum uh, is diagnosed when this angle is more than 39 degrees. As we see, this angle is formed from the central part of the femoral head with a vertical line and a line up to the anterior ends of the acetabulum. On cross-sectional imaging, namely CT and MRI, the anterior deficiency of the joint can be assessed with the AASA, <laughs> which is the anterior sector ankle and the posterior sector ankle. The HESA is both anterior and posterior sector ankles. The ankles are created from the central part from the femoral uh, hands up to the anterior aspect of the acetabulum. Here is how we measure this angle. This particular patient shows uh, an ASSA of 50 degrees, which is much less than the one expected for a woman. And this is why we diagnosed developmental dysplasia of the hip with advanced osteoarthritis, as we can see here. I would like now to discuss some topics which are very common in the routine clinical reporting and uh, every radiologist should be uh, uh, familiar with. First is the femoral acetabular impingement. This is an, a syndrome which uh, expresses the abnormal contact between the femoral head and the acetabulum. The first type is the CAMP, the CAMP type femoral acetabular impingement after this projection of the cam in the engines we have a reduced femoral head neck offset and therefore an abnormal contact with acetabulum the pincher type refers to the excessive other coverage where that means that the acetabulum is abnormal and the femoral head is normal sometimes we may have both types of this syndrome here is a 35 year old male with definitely abnormal joint space narrowing for his aids. What is going on there? We see that there is a bump projecting laterally in between the femoral head and neck. Therefore, this abnormal shape of the femoral head creates and the, the, the osteoarthritic changes here because of the uh, abnormal contact with the acetabulum. The acetabulum usually is normal and clinically uh, the patient presents with pain uh, after flexion and internal rotation or external rotation of the, of the hip jo joint. In MR we see displaced labrum which may completely detach and the cartilage which may fully delaminate. Quite commonly this appearance is called pistol grip deformity because it's very similar to the grip of a pistol. MR arthrography is the best way to go as we see here with this abnormal offset. The associated findings are the labral tears and in this example apart from the labral tears we show, we show to the clinician that there is a early delamination which is occult to the endoscopist. We need to highlight its presence for early treatment. So what's the natural history of camp type femoral acetabular impingement? In this 39-year-old female, as we see, there is pistol grip deformity bilaterally, but the joint space is still intact. 
in this space in 50 year old with the abnormal contours of the femoral head and neck bilaterally there is definitely joint space narrowing and advanced osteoarthritis with jailed formation bone marrow edema extensive labral tearing and um, uh, synovitis moving on to the pincher type femoral impingement the femoral head is normal and it is the acetabulum which is abnormal either from congenital overcoverage and retroversion or from acquired protrusion. An easy way to assess the abnormal acetabulum on the play film is to create a circle on the femoral hand, then draw a line which crosses perpendicularly the anterior and the posterior wall of the acetabulum. They should be normally apart 1.5 centimeters from each other when they are not as we see here with this crossover or aid sign then we have a diagnosis of acetabular retroversion more directly acetabular retroversion can be assessed on cross-sectional imaging either CT or MRI this is the normal appearance of the most superior slices of the hip joints we have a vertical line and the anterior acetabulum lies medial to the posterior one. When it lies lateral to the anterior, sorry, when the anterior lies lateral to the posterior one, then we have the diagnosis of a retroversion. Another and recently recognized syndrome regarding the area of hip and groin is the ischiofemoral impingement. There is hip pain in the syndrome related to narrowing of the space between the ischial tuberosity and lesser trochanda and this can be also seen with plain radiographs as we see here. Occasionally we, we may see also sclerotic and cystic changes on both sides of the impinging bones. This syndrome can be positional, congenital, and acquired by means of uh, lesions in this area, such as fractures of the lesser trochanda, uh, osteochondromas, or myositis ossificans. MRI shows edema within the quadratus femoris muscle, occasionally atrophy and tearing. Here we see an acute tear of the quadratus femoris muscle without any narrowing of this space, the ischiofemoral space. In another patient we see a chronic tear with fat infiltration and in this track athlete we see edema within the quadratus femoris muscle because of congenital narrowing of the ischiofemoral space. So we need to recognize this area and to carefully explore if there is any stenosis uh, in the ischiofemoral uh, space. Moving on to the hip osteoarthritis, this can be either primary or secondary. It's definitely very common, more than a hundred cases uh, for 100,000 population per year go for total hip osteoarthroplasty for osteoarthritis. Radiologically, uh, osteoarthritis is diagnosed when we have less than 1.5 millimeters joint space. This is a definite diagnosis and the probable diagnosis when we have less than 2.5 millimeters. As in all cases of osteoarthritis, we may see osteophyte formation, mainly marginal, subcondylar sclerosis and cyst formation, and femoral head deformity. When we need to assess the progression of osteoarthritis, then follow up films with the same technique with the patient standing or supine, but not different from each other the value of 0.6 mm per year stenosis is very useful in assessing a definite progression of the disease.
that when the joint space width in the, the original film when the patient presents with pain is less than two millimeters this is the best predictor of a progressive disease the role of MRI imaging in osteoarthritis is to directly assess the cartilage in the labrum the subchondrial bone marrow whereas MRI arthrography may show the cartilage degeneration and the labral tearing the biochemical imaging by means of T2 mapping, magnetization transfer contrast, diffusion weight imaging and degeneric is not currently routine clinical use, although it's provided in commercially available systems. Here we have the nice presentation of the labra and the articular cartilage with MR arthrography. The most important aspect though of hip osteoarthritis is when we have to deal with early osteoarthritis in young adults and middle-aged adults. This is the question from the clinicians. What's going on here? Then we have to see the C angle and the tonus angle if there is any subluxation because Developmental dysplasia of the hip is definitely associated with early arthritis. The pincher femoral acetabular impingement is not that commonly associated with osteoarthritis, only in the posterior aspect of the joint, whereas the cam type femoral acetabular impingement frequently shows early osteoarthritis as early as 25 years old in elite athletes. Finally, the trauma, previous trauma and heavy vascular necrosis may be associated with uh, early osteoarthritis. Moving on to the athlete hips, we need to know what to look for and therefore we need to be familiar with the mechanism of the injury, familiar with the specific sports related injuries and familiar with the expected spectrum of the findings that MR imaging can depict. We have seen a couple of cases with muscle strains in the adolescent part of this presentation. Here we see stress fractures in a long distance runner. The stress fracture is defined as a low signal intensity line which extends down to the cortex and is surrounded by bone marrow edema. In up to 50% of cases, the fractures are occult on plain radiographs, but in this particular patient, we can see this lucent line here, surrounded by some sclerosis in the medial cortex of the femoral neck. In the early phase of the stress injuries, we may see just bone marrow edema without any low signal intensity line. Here as well, and this football player, this is a tennis player. This is called stress reaction. Is the early phase, if it is not treated properly, it will proceed to stress fracture. Another stress fracture here, typical case. This is the medial aspect of femoral neck in a professional football player. Another young athlete with stress fracture here bone marrow edema extending to the muscles and here an occult avulsion fracture as the one that we showed previously other causes for the painful hip include the rotator cuff disease of the hip that means uh, that we have the generation of the gluteus medius uh, and minimus tendons perhaps with uh, bursitis, this is also called greater trochanter pain syndrome or clinically trochanderitis, tumors, infections, inflammatory arthropathies and avascular necrosis and transient osteoporosis which have been addressed uh, in another lecture. The final topic of this presentation is the evaluation of total hip replacement X-rays remain the mainstay of evaluating the prosthetic hip. 
We have also other tools such as astrography, aspiration scintigraphy, ultrasound, CT, and MRI. They all have a role in evaluating the painful prosthesis. However, CT and MR imaging are downgraded by the presence of metal-induced artifacts and therefore we have to be aware that demanding uh, techniques are required in order to get clinically useful results. Therefore, we start always with X-rays and we have to be familiar with the types of the surgical operations. The total hip astroplasty, for instance, refers to fixed devices on both sides. Hemiarthroplasty is defined as the replacement only of the femoral side. The unipolar hemiarthroplasty is the prosthesis which articulates directly to the acetabular cartilage, and the bipolar one is the prosthesis which articulates with an acetabular prosthetic cap. Here we have a nice result of total hip replacement. We see both devices and this is a lighter version with hip resurfacing only. How do we evaluate the total hip astroplasty patient? First, we see if there is any efflucency at the interface between the stem and the bone. This is normal. Then we see the center of the prosthetic head. It has to be at the same level as the control lateral healthy one. The prosthesis should have a tilt of around 30 to 50 degrees on the AP view and this is created with an horizontal line connecting the ischial bones and the edges of the cap. We need also to assess the screws if they are intact, occasionally CT is much more useful here, and to assess the iliorischial line or colorless line if there is any major encroachment on the prosthesis. These are some examples of complications. We see osteolysis, uh, reactive process to the metallic material, a fracture because of failure of the material, a periprosthetic fracture, a dislocation, and an aseptic loosening. This is the most important topic. The criteria for loosening include the loosency between the cement and the bone should be more than 2 mm. There should be progression in between follow-up radiographs. There should be a loosening in between the metal and the cement and fracture of cement mantle. Here we see another case with lucency and a fracture of the lesser trochanter. In another patient, extensive infection, osteomyelitis and septic arthritis required removal of the metals until uh, the end of the treatment before any planning for revision. Quite commonly we may also see a teratopic ossification which may cause impingement problems. Causes of primary total hip uh, replacement revision include mainly aseptic loosening. As you see here, in most of the cases we should look for aseptic loosening or particle disease. Dislocation, failure of the prosthesis, periprosthetic fracture or length -like discrepancy are not common. We have no time for showing examples with cross-sectional imaging, but in general, the ultrasonography is used for depicting the joint diffusion. The joint pseudocapsule is considered abnormal if it's more than three millimeters, and ultrasonography is very useful to guide aspiration
for uh, assessing any other line infection. A CT may be useful for evaluating the lysis of the median acetabular wall. A MRI is useful for infective effusions of valve muscles and perhaps bursitis infectious or not. In both cases, I mean CT and MRI, we need to be familiar how to minimize uh, the metal induced artifacts. In conclusion, plain radiographs are very useful for a global assessment of the hip joint. That means that we need to assess any presence of pistol grip deformity or aid sign or abnormal C ankle. It's the first step for assessing the ovation fracture in adolescence and the stress fractures. And of course, is still the mainstay for evaluating total hip astroplasty. MR imaging is the way to go for labral tests, cart cartilage injury or degeneration, and early osteoarthritis and femoral acetabular impingement and developmental displays of the hip. In addition, in the athletic population, stress reaction and fractures, muscle and tendon injuries should be assessed with MR imaging. I'd like now to show you two quick cases regarding hip pathology. Here we have a 17-year-old uh, football player with sudden left gluteal pain. The physical examination showed restriction of abduction. That's the AP view. CT, axial, coronal and sagittal. And MRI, fat suppressed images, protein density, and stir. Definitely, we have edema within the muscles. We have a few seconds for the showing the correct diagnosis. Yes, this is a hamstring avulsion injury, as you see nicely here, both with a CT and the plain radiograph. Plain radiograph is uh, adequate for showing the correct diagnosis. We do not need any advanced imaging for this particular patient. There was a concern of uh, severe associated muscular injuries. That's why he uh, underwent also MRI. So some comments on avulsion injuries. They are quite common in adolescents. The uh, they can be acute with an eccentric extreme muscular contraction or subacute at chronic in the acute setting. Plain radiographs uh, surface for the diagnosis whereas in the subacute and chronic or the so-called occult with minimal displaced lesion, we uh, may need CT and MRI. When the displacement is more than 2 cm, then we need an early surgical fixation. And this particular patient, the displacement was 12 mm. So this is the second case, middle-aged male with a dull pain of a tumor duration. Uh, appearing only when he plays football uh, in the weekends. Laboratory data and physical examination normal. That's the plain film. This is the bone scan, anterior and posterior view. This is the CT, bone, window, soft tissue window. T1, fat suppressed, T2, axial at coronal planes. Coronal fat suppressed, T1, contrast enhanced. Which do you think is the correct diagnosis? Yes, the correct diagnosis is low grade central chondrosarcoma. Here we see this matrix 
which is typical of uh, a cartilaginous lesion we see also here the spots of low signal intensity corresponding to calcifications and this thickening of the cortex with this endosteal scalloping so this is the third most common primary chima the median age is 45 mainly in men and the pelvic area is uh, a very common location of this expansal and osteolytic lesion occasionally these punctate calcifications are very difficult to depict and as we have seen previously the, the soft tissue window shows it to better advantage the industrial cortical thickening is typical of this uh, low-grade uh, chondrosarcomatous chima thank you for attending